So I spent a, a lot of the last five years trying to figure out how to kind of bring memorable personality out of uh, generative AI. And I just want to share some of the things that, that uh, played with and worked over, over that time. Um, so I, I think the first kind of leap we have to take when we're doing things with AI is that AI just sounds evil. You know, uh, I, we don't really market anything as artificial anymore. It's not really a good word in marketing, but it's amazing to me that we're spending millions of dollars, everybody's launching AI apps right now. That's like sort of the first leap we've got to get over. Um, but even in pop culture, you know, when you hear the word AI, it's usually something that's like unknowable or alien or indifferent to us. At, at worst, it's Skynet. At best, it's maybe the companion from her. But I don't want to spoil a 10-year-old movie, but that didn't turn out so well either. Um, but we've also been imagining for decades really like friendly and quirky and, and beneficial robot friends. And like my friend Cameron said, why aren't we spending more time trying to make Kit instead of her? Um, so I'll take what Cameron's saying one step further and say that I'm not really excited about a world with like creepy, almost human, you know, robots surrounding me, but I could get really excited about a world where I could hang out and talk with cartoons. Um, and that's what I spent a lot of the last few years trying to figure out how to do. Um, I was at companies, uh, you know, I spent most of the last 12 years at companies like YouTube and Duolingo. These are companies that don't call themselves AI companies, but they're crammed to the gills with machine learning. And with that machine learning, we're able to like entertain and engage people on a scale that was just never possible before. Um, but when we first started working with things like LLMs and AI voices at Duolingo, it wasn't anywhere near as powerful as it is now. And, and so we had to keep things really cartoony and simple. And in retrospect, that kind of feels like genius. Um, you know, you've all probably seen the Uncanny Valley graph, um, you know, that sort of shows that like things get a little too real, we don't really like it, but there's a sweet spot here where like things are really fun and cute and, uh, and we can really play in that space when we're playing with uh, generative AI. And it's actually, we're, we're actually kind of wired to do this. There's something about, you know, there's something about our brains where we see faces and everything, but we don't just see faces, we actually register an emotion and we register an emotional response. Uh, which is crazy, right? And I actually think that artists are people that maybe innately understand this. They understand how to provoke an emotional response with just a gesture, just a note. Uh, when you see Kermit, you immediately forget the puppeteer and you think that there's a living being in front of you, um, even though you know that hand is in there. So how do we, how do we try to create personalities with AI? Um, one thing is like try to make them memorable. Um, Fred Seibert, legendary animation producer, says, what makes characters distinctive and memorable is how they look, how they move, and how they sound. I thought a lot about that um, when we were creating the, the voices for the characters in Duolingo, which we trained AIs to do. And um, you know, we worked with, I worked with this uh, actress, Melody, and we really unlocked how to make one character, Lily, funny when we realized, we said, just say every line like your mom's forcing you to say it. We did that, and Lily was iconic and funny. Uh, another thing you can do is you can play with archetypes. There's lots and lots of literature on this subject. There's lots of books. You can go to TV tropes. but. There's tons of, there's these recurring archetypes that are in storytelling all the time. Think about maybe what kind of character you want your personality to be. One of my favorite types of characters is the Sundara character from anime. This is a character that is kind of harsh and doesn't, do, isn't nice to you when you first meet them, but they warm up as you gain their respect. Think about what an AI, a Sundara AI might be like and how rewarding it would be to get to know one. Another thing is to use shorthand. You know, when in TV and, and movies, we write these huge character Bibles um, that, like, this is 27 pages of Lost, right? That's really useful for a writer, but it's not great for ChatGPT. ChatGPT is trained on tons and tons of pop culture data. It's got a huge gestalt of stuff. And you can sometimes just use a really quick shorthand, like, oh, she's like a 14-year-old emo April Ludgate from Parks and Rec. And you'll get a pretty good result. You combine that with the way that it looks, the way that it moves, and the way that it sounds, and it feels like a pretty unique character. Uh, the last thing is to really embrace flaws and limitations. Um, C-3PO and R2-D2, very limited characters. They've got a lot of quirks. There's a lot, they're annoying, um, but they're really good at some things too, and that makes them relatable and endearing like people. Um, I'll leave you with one last story. When I was trying to figure out how LMs worked, um, one of the PMs said to me, well, you know how when you have a glass of milk, it's not from one cow, but it's like from all the cows? <laughs> and like, that kind of freaked me out. I didn't want to drink milk for a while after that. Um, <laughs> But it reminds me that like, when you're working with you know, these data sets and things like generative AI, this isn't actually an unnatural or alien thing. It's based on all the stuff that we've made, all the stuff that we've done. And so the soul's in there. You just have to figure out a way to coax it out. Um, that's it. Um, if you're interested in this kind of thing, please uh, get in touch. That's